Today, our guest is Yaakov Shweki. Yaakov Shweki was born in Jerusalem, Israel, to an Ashkenazi Jewish mother and a Sephardic Jewish father who was born in Cairo to a family from a Syrian background. His parents met and married in New York City. In his early years, Shweki lived in the Bait Vegan neighborhood of Jerusalem, but he, he eventually moved to Palanco, Mexico City, and attended Yeshiva Ateret Yosef. He later lived in Lakewood, New Jersey, and Brooklyn, New York, and attended Yeshiva Brooklyn before moving to Long Branch, New Jersey. As a child, he sang in the Ateret Yosef Choir in Mexico City, and he and his brother, Yisrael Mer, also sang with the Miami Boys Choir for a short period of time. After marrying Janine Schwecki, who is the co-founder of the Special Children's Center in New Jersey, he launched his professional career as a singer. Today, Schwecki is the biggest Jewish Hasidic musician in the world. His music gains popularity not only in the Orthodox Hasidic communities, but also in the secular non-Orthodox communities. He sang with the biggest musicians in Israel. Musicians such as Omar Adam, Shlomi Shabbat, Kobe Peretz, Ishai Rebo, and Hanan Ben-Ari. What makes Yaakov Shweki special is not only his music, but his and Janine's philanthropic work with children with special needs. His philanthropy continues because just this past May, Shweki, along with Mordechai Ben David and Ishai Rebo, had a concert called Together as One, and all the proceeds were donated to benefit the Israel COVID Relief Fund. Welcome, Yaakov, to our show. We are so happy you're here today. Thank you. I wanted to tell you it's really a personal uh, dream of Etty and I to interview where you were very big fans of yours. You should know you're on my personal playlist. I love your music. Uh, just one little thing. Can you guess what, which song is one of my favorites? Just take a guess. Which song is wow. one of You've got to give me an album at least. <laughs> <laughs> Too many songs the it's album. Oh my oh, gosh. I can tell you, you have so many amazing songs, but it's Etrecod. Okay, that, that's a classic. <laughs> I have to tell you that a personal dream of mine, Anetis, is that I would, Bezlat Hashem, when my daughter gets married, I want you there singing at her wedding. Oh, that's beautiful. How old's your daughter now? Well, she's 18, thank God. So there's <laughs> some time, there's time, but. That's my dream, and it's her. It's gonna be her dream too. You know, Yaakov, when she asked David, she goes, David, when we try to coordinate this, she's like, David, now that we are talking and we are going to have Shweki on, are you going to give us a family discount? And he said, No, I'll give you better than a family discount. And we are like, Ah, oh, what could be better than a family discount? He said, I'm going to give you a bracha that you won't need a family discount. I told him, we'll take that. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. By the way, I, I noticed that your father is Egyptian. I'm like quarter Egyptian too, so. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I have an interesting mix, you know. It's an right. interesting mix. But, but uh, my mother was born in the DP camps in Germany. My father got a Sephardic heritage. So, again, I also grew up in Brooklyn. I went to Mexico for a few years. I came back to Brooklyn. Now I'm in Jersey. So uh, the whole mix of. You know, I think it helped me throughout my career now in the 20 year career so far, you know. I think that's, you see that in your music too. Yeah. Uh, really, you, you see a mix of different cultures, different backgrounds in all your songs. And that, that, that's what, that was one of my main missions, you should know, when I first started was to give, like she said, your partner said over there, Hasidic, um, it's not necessarily true. The, the, the Hasidim also listened to me, but the Jewish music fan before I started didn't get so much a diverse culture within one album. They always used to get it. This album had that, that album had this, this album had that. My mission was when I first started was to try to in include a lot of different sounds within one album. And that's what, that's what I wanted to separate myself from a lot is that um, is that I can do it because of my heritage and what I grew up like. I grew up as totally different cultures coming together as one. And I wanted to do that, like you said, on the music and on the albums and, and bring that out. And that's what came to be. And people really, really opened up their arms to it and really uh, 
really love that about it because in one album, you get every different, uh, you know, every different you sound. In so many languages, in Spanish, in Hebrew, in French, in Yiddish. It's fabulous. Yeah, you, you know what? Music is the language of the soul. And right. if you have, have a neshama within you that speaks to different types of Jews and different types of people all over the world. You know, when I started traveling 20 years ago and going different different concerts all over the world, I realized that the Jewish community, you know, in the last, uh, who knows, after World War II, you know, who are living everywhere, they have communities that speak different languages. They want different types of, you know, sounds in their music. And I was traveling all over and I realized that, hey, I got to give everybody what, and also you, you'll be surprised that in America itself, you have people wanting also to hear different, you know, different sounds. Right. Uh, Am Israel, hi, Am Israel, hi. You know, they wanted a different, different uh, sound. The, right, different beats, different. No, it's so funny because we, you see that in the music before I knew your background. So I was like, you know, because I always thought that you were Ashkenazi, just Ashkenaz. But I said, but yes, that's far big bit in the music. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, how did, I, you guys, how did you guys start what you're doing and how long you've been doing it? We, I'll tell you, our, it's so funny that you said that. We started our show because we want, we noticed that a lot of the Jewish communities are divided, like Israelis, Ashkenaz, Sephardic. And we noticed that there is a lot of issues that are not brought to the table. So we kind of started this show to connect the communities, especially with anti-Semitism on the rise. We, we, and we didn't know how to do it. And we, one of the reasons that we have a lot of musicians come in, actors, actresses, some are Jewish, some are not, to try to connect the communities and to bring up issues um, that people don't like to address. And a lot of people do it through music or through acting or through shows. And that's why we bought that show because as mothers, we were really worried about the future of our people because we are very united when there is an emergency but look at the politics right now, just in Israel, what's going on. But we are very divided on so many levels. And we thought to bring a show that will kind of connect everyone and everyone could relate to. So we love like a baseline that we can all relate. So we actually need to pick the people that we thought will fit that model of, for the show. And you're it. <laughs> And I, I mentioned that we're, you know, we've been friends for almost four decades and we have a lot of friends and they always said, you should bring your friendship to a show because you have so much to discuss in terms of your friendship and the things that you do and your adventures and the people you've met. So you should have a platform for that to share that with people. So we just decided to take them up on that. And it's been a, it's been an adventure and a lot of fun. You know what? Yaakov, yeah. I'll tell you something. Sure. You know, when I asked other people to come, a lot of them wanted to discuss their projects, their songs, and you're very enough, like you're very humble. Because when I spoke, and I was shocked, I, not that I was shocked because we see you on stage, we see you singing, we see you in parties, we see you in concert, and you go, oh, wow, he's amazing. You, you, you're very friendly to your audience. But when we asked David to have you on the show, you told him, I will come, but I don't want to discuss my music. I want to discuss the uh, special children's center. Um, and I thought that was so humble and very touching because people, you don't see that. You don't see that in our world. People are only about themselves. And I wanted to ask, why did why was it so important to you from all your work and all your achievements? Why was it so important for you to for us to discuss that and not your music necessarily? Uh, you put it very well. You put it in a very listen. I I really believe that um, that to make the world a better place. Let's just look. My wife started when she was sixteen years old. I know she's not here to tell you, but I'll tell you that she. She started when she was 16. She was a, a girl living in Deal, New Jersey. Um, she went with a friend of hers to a home to help out a family with a, with a special child. 
And they slept there for two weeks on the floor, um, helping this family cope um, with this child of theirs. And they realized then and there that their calling in this world, because they had, they didn't, first of all, they didn't have any issues. They didn't have any, uh, uh, they didn't do it for money. They didn't do it for notoriety. They didn't do it for fame. They didn't do it for anything else than to just help people. And they decided to use their personal money, savings and money, to rent an apartment and to start something called the Special Children's Center, where they'll bring children to have music therapy. They realized that it took three hours to bathe the child, where, where you know, the family hope they can't, they can't do anything with their other children. They can't do it. They realized right then and there that they're calling in this world. They love special children. They love what they stood for. The special child has no, no complaints, no politics, like you said. The right. special child, your soul. The special child knows the truth. They know how to love. They have no complications. They don't want anything from anybody. Right. And they, they loved helping these children. They took their personal money. They, they rented an apartment. They started with three children. The following year, 10 children, 15 children. When I met Janine, when I was, uh, she was already 23 at the time. She already had, I don't know, close to 100 children in this place. Wow. My first, How yeah, old my, was she, if you don't mind me asking? 23. 23. 23. Wow. Yeah, How so she started, you know, when I'm talking on a date with her, you know, even the first date, she's saying, you know, I want to meet you to whatever, whatever it was with my children. And I said, your children? <laughs> I, I said, one second, do I know what you don't know? You know, what do you mean my children? I thought she had kids with somebody, else. who knows? So she's like, no, no, my special children. And she called it, she really believed and she's still to this day, you know? So I, once I met her and, I, and we ended up getting married and I really took upon myself the responsibility also, it's $10 million a year, you know, these organizations, it's not a joke. Uh, it's helping over 500 families. It's a huge, oh. huge, it's a huge undertaking. And I realized then and there that my calling in this world is not just music. Of course, music is a passion of mine. And it's something that we brought, you know, so much happiness and joy, which we don't take lightly. I take, a, I take it as a responsibility. But I'm not here anymore to push my music. Thank God that's gone very well. You know, God has uh, given me the gift. It's not mine. He gave it to me. He lent it to me. And it's something that I want to use to, to help unite people and bring people together. And that's, that's what music does, especially in this day and age where, you know, anything you say could be held against you, no matter what you believe, you always fall, uh, you always fall into a certain category when you say something. You can't even take the person, you can't even debate anybody anymore. Right. It's not even a debate. It's just say what you want to say and then, uh, you know, you belong to a certain category. Which, you know. Yaakov, um, what are some of the challenges and difficulties and hardships you've overcome or you're working to overcome? And how, how can what you learned help others? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, the difficulty and hardship for me is to juggle everything and have the priorities, you know, where to do what and what. This life is so busy for me mm -hmm. that I feel that you know, I want to do what makes the creator proud. I want to do what makes my family proud. I have a mission in this world to try to make myself a better person constantly and to work. The Torah always tells you to work on your character and try to be a better person because life by very quickly. My daughter just got married uh, on February 9th. But <laughs> oh, before you know it, you know, I didn't realize I was going to have a son-in-law so fast and, and uh, <laughs> daughter getting married. So life goes by so fast. I think the challenge is to juggle everything and have your priorities right to what to do when. So. Oh, that, there you are. Yeah, we just got a video just blanked out for a second. But, you know, that, that's the, it's, you know, but that's the story of life. That's the challenges of life, you know? So did you sing at a wedding? <laughs> Who was the singer? You know what? I tried to. I tried to. Uh, I. I. Uh, I tried to get away, but. Um, but they made me work a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you. Um, 
another thing that you are very known for, other than being humble and working with the children with special needs, is your special relationship um, with Ovadia Yosef, the late Ovadia Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Uh, you even wrote a song, um, Abba Shel Kulam, Abba Shel Am, which is true. It's, he's the, he was the father of everyone. He was the father of the nation. And unfortunately, you don't see manhigim like that anymore. How did you meet uh, Rabbi, the late Rabbi uh, Ovadia Yosef and how, how did you form the bond? Because I know you were, as much as you thought it was special to you, I know you are very, very special to him. Uh, I want you to find out how did you guys meet and... That's, you know what, you bring, you bring back some memories with that question. Um, I remember going to him, my first trip to Israel doing concerts, you know, was my mission to, before I did any shows, was to get a blessing from him. And the first time I went to him, was uh, he, really, he really took me in for a long time and we spoke and we hit it off, you know, with the relationship. And he, he told me that he, his relationship with my family, my great grandparents going back to, all the way to Egypt and all the way to Cairo, you know, my great, great uncle gave him his first job as a rabbi, you wow. know, in Egypt. And he had a lot of gratitude to my family because of what they did for him. And we hit it off very well. And he, he also loved Loved, started singing. His his face lit up. You know he, he he loved it. So he eventually brought me in. You know also at times when he wasn't feeling well or he was this and that. I used to come to his family personally, just me and my little kids then. And we used to get blessings all the time. And and I hit it off with him because you know the love. First of all, I loved his unconditional love for Jewish people. You know he did everything possible for every type of Jew. You know, first of all, the fact that he had almost a million people at his funeral, one of the biggest funerals of all time, is just shows when you love everyone unconditionally and you're ready, ready to help everyone and you're ready to, you know, no matter if it's religious, not religious, you're always respecting one another. The first thing you have to have is respect and love for one another. Then you can get, then you can get, and that was his, his mission in this world was to also make Judaism and the religion for people that can't handle the heavy orthodox way was to lighten the load in a way that, you know, the Torah allows a certain way of saying yes to certain questions and saying not every, no, no, no. Of course there are rules, there are no's also, but there are also yeses. And his job in life, his mission was to find that yes that's allowed because he loved people so much and I, I, lit, I, I love that way about him because if you're, if, if you're here to love and you're here to include and you're here to find a way how to bring people joy and how to this and that, that first of all, it shows in his funeral, like I said, and I just love that, that way about him. Right. He was never judgmental. Just no. like you said, he accepted no. all Jews as Jews, somewhere more Hasidic, somewhere less. And I think that's why everybody connect, politicians, everybody connected. By the way, you know, my uncle was the mankal of Kol Israel for Sephardic music. He was a violinist, Zuzu Musa, and he was very close to him as well. So I met Ovadia Yosef through my uncle. Um, he also passed away, really great musician. Wow. Otherwise, I would introduce you guys. <laughs> so, I want to... Go ahead. you find that in his funeral, while I'm looking at the footage, I was crying, making that song. Composing that song took a lot of tears. And I'm okay. composing... And I'm looking, I'm looking at the pictures of a working man that's working in a shawarma store crying, and then a Hasidic guy crying, and then a guy who's outside of his cab, a taxi cab, crying to... It shows you that when, when a rabbi like that loves everyone, soldiers, policemen, whoever it was, he included, loved them, and they all felt that, and they all wanted to be a part of that historic funeral. That just shows you what, you know, what love is all about. So I'll yeah. tell you, there are two songs that you sing that always make me cry. The one for Ovadia Yosef, and when you see the video, you just, you cannot not cry. And when you sang Kolot with Shlomi Shabbat, I, it was magical. 
It's like two songs that I don't know why those specific songs, but every time I hear them, they touch my soul. <laughs> I have many that do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, yeah actually, what? I wanted to ask you, um, all your songs are truly phenomenal. We're huge fans, as we said. Um, but these particular songs, such as I Can Be, A Mother's Promise, and One Heart, I can see these songs as crossing over to mainstream radio. How would you feel if your songs were on mainstream radio? You know what? My mission was never that. My goal really was not that. My goal was really to bring a, a, a certain heartfelt, soulful music. I believe that. Obviously, if it's on radio, it is on radio. It wasn't my mission, really, to do that. But um, if it does, it does. But it wasn't never... Uh, I think that today they have so many genres and so many different... You know, I don't think a lot of stations maybe are looking for that religious angle on anything. But I agree. That's not a religious... That's not, not so much a religious angle on those songs. Right. Because right. I Can Be is just like... It's so positive and... Uh... I mean, I yeah. can see that. I, I love the fact, uh, yeah, I love the fact that I go around the world and kids in Panama or in Argentina or in Mexico or wherever I am around the world are singing that's in Paris. Even if they don't know English, they know that song. That's they know so a One Heart. They know Cry No More. You know, the songs crossed over to languages even that don't know, people that don't know English want to learn English because the song is so good. So... Yeah, I can the same, be the same applies to me because like I don't speak Hebrew and I sing your songs in Hebrew and I don't understand some of the things I'm saying but I I feel the words of the music and I know certain things what certain things mean and I put it together so the same applies to me with the Hebrew so so what I try what I try to do is I try in concert when I'm live in your city or in somebody else's city that doesn't know I try to explain to them sometimes not every song I can't do it with every song but I try to tell them that our music especially my music I don't look at it as a form of just entertainment you know in California or this and that or in America in general music is a form of entertainment for for Jewish orthodox especially if you study and I've studied Torah for a long time I've been lucky to sit and study the Talmudic text and the Gemara and, and, you know, on a deep level, you realize music was a part, part and parcel of the religion itself. King David woke up in the morning singing soulful songs to the creator because that's the way he connected. Music was a, was a connection from the human to the creator. And the Bet HaMikdash, all the, the Levim, this, that, this, all, they sang a lot. So singing and music was not just a form of coming to a concert and clapping and going home and say, you know what? Hey, I was entertained. What a great show. Music was a way of talking the language from within and really giving them messages that, hey, you know, when I go to a school now, especially a school of young kids and the place is going crazy, this and that, and kids come over to me many years later sometimes and say, hey, I decided to study more because I listened to you. I, that, that to me is a goal, you know, to have the music, you know, change a person for the better in whatever way possible. If it's, if it's something, you know, uh, becoming a better person, loving somebody, including somebody more, you know, if, if helping a special child, going and opening up your own organization to help people, to help hungry people. There's so many different things you can do. If the music has... You know, and that's why she asked me a question before why I didn't want to talk so much just about the popularity of music. That's not what gets me. What gets me is how the, what the goal was and how it's being formed and how it's being accepted amongst people and how they're actually elevating themselves through the music. And that to me is a lot bigger goal than just entertainment. I think what you show kids really that you can be cool, whatever, <laughs> you know, cool, you can sing, you can party and be orthodox. And, uh, and, and people really, when they think of orthodox, especially kids, the newer generation, it's not cool anymore. And with you, they say, you know what? I can have cool music and be orthodox. I just wanna tell you, when our kids found out and their friends that we are interviewing today, <laughs> interviewing you, 
they were begging us to come to the studio. And we're like, we're not having a concert. We're, well, we just want to see him. I'm like, well, you see him all the time. We just want to talk to him. They feel like, they feel so connected to you. You're very approachable to them because of the music. Where do you guys live? We live in Valley Village in California. You know very what? Large I Orthodox community. Yeah, what's that? It's a very, very large Orthodox community. I want to tell you, with the point that you made before right now is a much bigger point than what sometimes we think it is. Um, the point that you made was a very, very good point. Um, I see that with a lot of kids today. They believe that Orthodoxy, you have to, you can't enjoy the world, enjoy life, and yet be Orthodox at the same time. They really have a misconstrued and confused, not because they, don't, they just don't know. They just weren't fed from the right people and the right information. And when a person went to like Chacham Ovadi Yosef, he knew right away that, hey, he told me, or he told me that I can be me. You can be anything you want to be if you put your mind to it with the Torah way. You can do it. Yes, you have to. There are laws. There are laws not because God is up there waiting with the ruler. You know, when I was a little kid, I thought that Hashem was, God was waiting there with the ruler, waiting to strike me anytime I did anything wrong. That's a totally distorted, uneducated view of what the Torah is all about. The Torah is loving. Of course, there are rules and there is, there is rules for us as a, not as a punishment, as the greatest gift. Somebody asked me, like, Shabbat, what, I have to stop my cell phone? I have to stop my car? I have to, it's too much restrictions. It's too many restrictions. I said, the truth is, you're right. It takes, it takes getting used to. But I'm telling you, I keep Shabbat every Shabbat, and I realize now that it's the greatest gift in the world to shut off everything and all the technology and all the stuff and connect with my family, with my children around the table, singing songs, connecting with Hashem, having actual, you know, now with all the technology that you can shut off, that, that people are addicted to, that you can actually cut that out and actually have conversations with real people without any phones is like, I, I, I tell Hashem every single weekend on Shabbat, thank you Hashem for giving me the greatest gift you can ever give me. And that's when I really connect with my wife. I connect with my children. We have a meal together. We actually sing songs for hours and hours and hours. And that's, and that to me is, is if we look at it as restrictions, we look at it as, as commandments and he's waiting to put, it's the wrong way. Hashem is the most loving creator that he created us to have, to give us the life, to give us, you know, the, the Torah, not just to, to have restrictions and this and that. That's that, I think that's a, a very important point you make. Yaakov, we're going to make, give you another job to come and talk to our youth, you know? <laughs> I, I, we, yeah. I mean, we need more people because I see a lot of kids that are in orthodox. See, I was not orthodox. For me, it was the opposite. I put my kids in orthodox school because it was important to me. And through my kids, <laughs> because of my kids, uh, it, was, it worked the other way around. And, you know, okay, now that, you know, my oldest daughter, you know, she just graduated medical school. <laughs> uh, so my... Uh, okay. My kids are older and like, they, you know, she left the house now to do a residency. Now I miss it. Like while they were growing up in the beginning, I was like, oh, you know, I have to keep Shabbat because the kids are keeping. Sh and eventually you just keep stuff because your kids are keeping and nobody's going to come up with it. And now when they're starting to leave the house and you're used to having Shabbat at home and using Shabbat dinner, Shabbat, you know, lunch with all the friends, you really value what it is. And, you know, a lot of kids don't see that until much later. We entertain a lot also in our community. Etsy and I entertain a lot. We invite a lot of people to our home on Shabbat. So we're very immersed with our community and with our friends and, you know, just having people over for Chagim and Shabbat. So... You know, Beautiful. I decorate, she cooks. <laughs> I give my, my Egyptian mom the cooking part with Karen, and I decorate everything. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. You know, because we believe um, on a deeper level, you know, we believe that the holiday spirit is not just commemorating what's past in history. 
we believe, you know, Reb Dessler talks about, there's a lot of books that talk about it, but for instance, like a, a holiday of, uh, let's say Rosh Hashanah, for instance, the holiday is in the air right now, meaning you can, you can, if you can celebrate correctly, you can actually pull spiritual sparks, you know, and actually let it imbue in you and become a different person if you celebrate it correctly. It's not just a celebration, hey, of what happened, uh, I don't know, a thousand years, a few thousand years ago, whatever it is. It's right now happening, and Hashem made it that way. If you learn the proper rules and you learn the halachot and you learn a little bit of background of what it is, and, what, and a lot of times the youth, they don't really know the depth of it. So they just want it, they just say, hey, it's just a restriction because if you don't know about it and you didn't study it and you didn't put time, a little bit of time and use, use your head to understand the background and why it was created and what it is for and what we're doing, every holiday has a great lesson in life. You just have to actually sit down and start to, uh, to study and to start understanding the depth. You know, there was a great story about a Buddhist Jew. I actually went to sing at his Sheva Berachot. He was, became a, a, a billionaire. This guy hired me. He made like uh, an, a huge party in Masada and in Israel. And I, I actually, before I started singing, I asked my friend, what's this guy's background? And he said he was one of those guys, spiritual guys that didn't know anything about Torah. And he went to, and he had a meeting, you know, with his connections, he had a meeting with the Dalai Lama, you know, and, and the Dalai Lama, he got to the Dalai Lama and he thought he was going to get such spiritual, you know, he was a very spiritual guy and he was searching, you know, there's so many people that are searching for spiritual. And the Dalai Lama asked him point blank, his first question, where do you come from and who are you? He said, the truth is, I'm, I'm a wandering Jew that just, I'm looking for some spiritual help. He says, you're Jewish? He says, yeah, I'm Jewish. He says, do you understand what kind of tradition and what kind of heritage you come from? Do you understand that your nation, even though the smallest in quantity, have lasted thousands of years through hate, through persecution, through everything you can ever imagine in history happened to this nation and they're still here? Do you understand where you come from? Go back to your place. Go back to the Holy Land in Israel and study your tradition. You don't have to come here. And he turned around and he got up and he went back to Israel. He's a religious Jew now that, that actually gives a tremendous amount of charity to a lot of different causes. Nice. And sometimes you have to hear it from the other side to understand the right. depth. What we have. Right. Oh, you know, Yaakov, um, shifting gears a little bit, I, I just wanted to touch upon something. Um, it's safe to say that there's about a million Hispanic Jews in the world, and I actually happen to be one of them. Can you please tell us about your experience when you were living in Mexico City prior to getting married? And do you consider yourself a Hispanic Jew or a Halabi? And uh, how has your experience been for you to sing in Spanish with such songs as uh, One Heart? You know what, first of all, song One Heart, I just wanted to convey a message that I do speak a little bit of Spanish. And- uh, Mexico City, I, correct? Yeah, and I love Mexican food. But besides that, my, <laughs> my, my, but the point was is that all Jews, no matter where they're from and what language they speak, they're all one heart and one, one, uh, one heart and one, you know, the language may be a little bit different, but the heart and the soul is the connection that we are sisters and brothers, no matter where we live. But anyway, but as far as that, I mean, my uncle, first of all, is a rabbi in Mexico for over 45 years, almost 50 years already. And I kept, I kept going there in Mexico and I happened to love the passion even though I'm not a Mex I'm not a Spanish Jew myself, but I, I loved the the passion and the not just the love of music, actually the living of music. Meaning when I did a show, it wasn't just watching me sing. The place I'll never forget the first show I did in Mexico City after my first album, my manager almost fell off his seat because he told me he's never seen a Jewish crowd. He's never seen a crowd in his life 
sing that loud on every song and every note, like the Spanish Jews in Mexico and, and all, even in pa Mexico especially, it, the passion and the love that they have for music was a tremendous, you know, it was an eye opener for my manager. We kept the, obviously we go there every year. We actually have to cancel since this COVID-19 started. We just canceled a few shows there, but in Brazil as well. But the, the love and the passion that they show. So I do, I happen to love the Mexican, uh, the Spanish people, because when you sing for them, first of all, I don't even have to sing much. I just sing one note and I just hold out the mic. And they play. <laughs> but, but, you know, it sounds like an office. You know, I just put like the music and can't start singing around the office. <laughs> and thank God she's. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite that's my favorite that's a favorite and i have to tell you i can't post it on facebook but i have a she didn't know i was taping her she was sitting on her desk one day <laughs> and doing research and i hear her, and it's really funny because she doesn't speak hebrew so she says the words the way she wants. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to understand the language. Yeah, she the said, that record, that record. And I'm like, that's a steak, Karen. That's <laughs> <laughs> record. Okay. My kids always substitute words and songs as well. You know, I have a song, uh, Gila Gila Rina. Dita Dita. So they go, Gila Gila Rina. Pizza Pizza. Chedva Ahava. So they put in words anyway. If you can put in a word or two that's, you know, one of your favorite dishes, why not? You know, right. <laughs> we won't have a problem with food, right, Ati? No, we <laughs> won't have a problem. Actually, we would love to invite you and Janine if you come to L.A. Oh, so cute. Say hello. Hi. Hi. Say hello. Hi. Hi. You're so cute. What grade are you in? What grade are you in? He's in first grade. Oh, wow. He, he, he's in first right now or is he going in first? Are you you going into second? Yeah. He's going into second. Is it right? hard to have school online? Is it hard to have school like not going into school itself? Like uh, just doing it? No, now school's over, so. <laughs> now, <laughs> now you can just have fun. He uh, seems happy, but you know. He still learns. He still learns. He has a shirt that I come to the house every single day, right? Right. Tell your brother to come and say hello too. Go tell Natan to come over. I have to ask you, Yaakov, you know what I notice? A lot of the Israeli singers are now doing a lot of religious songs. Have you noticed it? Even before of COVID, like even, fame, like even um, musicians that are normally identified as atheists even, like they, it's, they, they were not even uh, a reform. They just like, you can tell they didn't believe like in Hashem. And all of a sudden, a lot of them are, almost all of them have at least one song that has to do with Hashem or, or about Judaism. A lot of the singers, which I've been saying for years, you should know, going into the studios and, okay. And going to the studios, Natan, say hello. Okay. Say hello for a second. Hi. 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 so cute. You're getting cuter. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. So you have boys and one girl? All boys and one girl? Three boys, three girls. Wow. wow, beautiful. Yeah, thank God. Thank God. These are the best, best gifts I could ever ask for. Absolutely. So what I was saying was is that music you should know that I've been saying this for many years, going into the studios and speaking to also not religious singers, telling them that you should do more religious songs. I always push for that because how many songs could you hear of I love her and she loves me and we did this and we did that. It doesn't last, those songs you should know don't last a long time. Even, I, I try to tell them even business wise, if you're just looking, which I don't really care, but if you care about business, Understand that the songs that have real value that last for a long time are not the the bubblegum, uh, right. you know, unrealistic, not deep messages. Mm -hmm. Those songs don't last as much at all if you look at the history, especially Israeli music, because Israeli music 
a Jew has depth. No matter who you are, you have depth and you have a certain, a certain uh, you know, message to convey to the nation that you should know, even not religious, sometimes I sing in not religious places and the crowd is 70, 80% not religious. They're all singing with me on top of their lungs. Right. Some of them crying, some of them really feeling the messages because they have a deep neshama within them. Whether they practice it or not, that's, who knows? Maybe they weren't educated enough. Maybe they don't know enough. That's never, you're never judgmental into, you know, you try to bring them closer. And this right. is, this, you're right. Other singers are finding that, that um, the way to reach the real neshama is not just uh, entertained, to really have songs that talk to people. No, because I know this because we have a lot of friends that are not religious and we know this and they like a certain artist and now that they're doing more uh, songs like that, a lot of our friends are like a little bit more curious about Shabbat, a little bit more curious about how to pray. They ask us more questions. So we know this, that those people actually are bringing people at least curiosity wise to learn a little bit more and you know what and that's important that's important because there are so many people that don't have the experiences in life that sometimes you know change them as people towards more religion they don't have that experience and sometimes they have to they have to grab on to things later on in life and realize that you know there's a lot more depth to life than just working making money and uh and fancy cars or fancy clothes and this, that doesn't really satiate the soul and make you really happy because the soul eventually cries out within you i had a story in johannesburg i was in south Africa. Oh, I like that. that was great I, I was in south africa with my dear friend colin goldstein and he wanted to i wanted to buy a few gifts before the i think it was uh the day I was leaving, I wanted to always buy gifts for my children, especially when I go very far. So I went with him to the mall and I went to an electronic store in the middle of Johannesburg and I was buying something. I forgot what it was. Maybe it was a camera. And I'm there and on the counter and I put the camera down. I said, okay, you know what? I'll buy this one. I put the camera down and there was a girl next to me waiting, you know, to speak with the, uh, with the guy, with the salesperson. And I put my credit card down and it says Shweki Music on the, on the credit card. So she looks at me and she goes, is that you? I said, uh, depends who you is. She <laughs> says, this is a you, Yaakov Shweki, the singer. I said, yeah. I said, you know what? Who are you? She tells me her name. She doesn't, even, I, didn't, I didn't even know she was Jewish. I didn't know anything. She says, the truth is, I, I stopped. I, I can't listen to you so much in the last few years anymore. I said, really? Nobody's ever told me that before. I said, why is that? And she said, because every time I listen to you, I cry. Oh. And, and I, I cry because my neshama tells me, she says, I, I was religious and now I'm not religious. And I feel guilty about the fact that I said, first of all, you don't have to feel any guilt when you listen to music. Music is supposed to have a certain you know serenity and a certain peace within your soul you're supposed to listen yes you want to try to get better you want to ask questions you want to this but music is not about guilt it's about it's about your soul singing as well so it was it was a telling story for me because somebody like that i actually got her name and her address and we sent her cds and we kept into so so everything was fine with her wow but, that's amazing you know, Jacob, um, before we're going to close out here today, we've had such an amazing time with you. I wanted to ask you one final question before Etty says our goodbyes. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you could send a message to a large group of people, who would those people be? And what would your message say? If I could send the message, um, I would say what I said before. The message would be that you have to have great love and respect for one another before you even have, you know, you guys are doing a show about talking to people and teaching people. The greatest lesson you can teach is, is the fact that the more, the more orthodox you are, you know, the more loving you should be, not the other way around. America looks at religion totally different 
you know, that you're totally segregated from, from different, yes, you have certain rules, you have certain this, but if you can love everyone that says, you have to love your friend like yourself. You have to love you. If you have that love, you know, for people and for the community and wherever you're going and you want to really love and change the world, if that step is first, you will get so much further in life than to, than to say, hey, and be judgmental and why he looks like this and why she looks like that and why... You know, the, the, the Lashon Hara, which we say is the evil language about talking about others. Whenever my family, you should know, brings up any names in my house, I always tell them, I don't want to talk about people. I right. don't talk about people. I don't want to talk any negative, anything about anybody. Even if somebody did you wrong, I try to teach my children. Even if somebody did you wrong, try to judge them favorably and move on. Yes, you're going to have hurtful feelings to snap. Try to get over that and move on and try to... If the world would do that, and if you can teach that, and you can, you know what I learned a great lesson from? The special children. The special children, I like that. There are, they're, they're non-judgmental, unconditional love, you know, pure. There was a mother who wrote a beautiful poem in, in Janine Center. She said, you know, when you were born, you know, you taught me how to laugh. You taught me how to cry. You taught me how to love. You taught me how to be honest. You taught me this and you taught me that. And she goes on and she goes and the last line is, so who's the teacher, you or I? I thought, she thought when the baby was born, she's going to have to teach them everything. Meanwhile, just look at them and look how they live and try not to be too complicated. And then you'll just, this, this is what I would say. I know it's a lot to say, but I have a lot more, but I don't want to take it. You know what? That's exactly, the, you just wrapped up our show because we know this, there is so much Lashon Ra. You know, and you know, I, and one of the reasons um, we actually always talked about it is my kid, who is 10 now, I have them very big, you know, 27, 17, and 10, you know, because I wanted by the time the little one leaves, I'll, I'll be a senile. <laughs> I won't even notice that she's leaving. <laughs> but one day she comes home about three years ago, and I was talking to Karen because Karen is my best friend. And I said, Well, I was Shabbat at your friend's house. She goes, I didn't like it. And I said, what, what is there a lot to like about Shema? They were always talking about other people's problems. And I, it was, she was so observant. She was like eight years old. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, Ima, you know, we discuss books and you guys argue about politics because in our house, we argue about politics all the time. <laughs> she goes, they were just discussing the, everybody's problems. And, you know, a little kid cannot say gossip. They don't understand what it is. But it wasn't fun for her. And we noticed it with a lot of people. Like, oh, this one is not this, and this one is not that. And there is so much Lashon Ara, and what people don't understand, the less we do, and the less we judge people, the more united we'll become. You know what? The, the today's world, it's a much, much more challenging world than the world that I grew up in even with the social media and everything. You guys are using zoom for a great cause. You guys are using social media for a great cause to teach people and to understand people. You know, it, it's, it's a very big challenge for today's youth with social media, how to navigate through life and how to, it's a great, great challenge you should know. And the more we can spread love, the more you can spread good, the more you can spread the real Torah messages that when we accepted the Torah as a nation, we accepted it, it says, where we were one and we were truly one heart. And that's the way Hashem, the reason why we got the Torah is because we were on that level. So we have to always try to achieve that as a nation and not look at so much, you know, if you listen to the politics today, it's very difficult because each one is jabbing the other one so much that, you know, they just want to make mincemeat of each other. And by the time the, the election goes, people think this. And be, so it's very hard not to bring that into your own life. If you can try to block those things out and understand that life is much, much more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're here for a very short time. Make the best of it and understand that if you're positive and look at, uh, look at the example who we mentioned before in the interview, Chacham Obadi Yosef, who included everyone, who gave classes. I remember him going by helicopter to soldiers in the army somewhere in some army base. He wasn't feeling well. He took a helicopter. He spoke to them. 
they felt like they were the most luckiest people in the world, and they were. At the same time, he wanted to give a message that, hey, I'm not too big for anyone. I'm not too famous for anyone. I want to include everyone, and I want to try to give the best I can in life because life goes by very fast. And if, the, if that's the mission that you can try to tell the, the youngsters and try to, and that's what I try to do, you know, I think, I think we, can, uh, we can change the world one soul at a time. That's what it's yeah. about. Yaakov, we can tell you are the very good teacher because you're very, very humble. And um, I want you, if you can stay a few minutes after I do the closing, just we want to chat with you for a few seconds before we sure. leave. Um, sure. So Yaakov, thank you so much. Ishaq Koch, to you and Janine, uh, your work with the Special Children's Center combined with the beautiful, uplifting music touches our souls. We need more people like you who are doers in our communities. We feel so blessed that you took time out of your very, very busy schedule to have this interview with us. And we hope uh, to take you out to dinner the next time you're in Los Angeles. We would love for you to meet our husbands and our families. Um, we would like to thank all our followers for listening to this episode. Please remember, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at yes, Yentas in the City. You can also write at dearyentas at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you and answer your letters, concern on our weekly advice column. We would like to thank our team, Shimi and Sharon, for all behind the scene work to bring this episode together. And a special thank you to Yaakov Shweki's manager, David. David, you are amazing for working out all the logistics to make this happen. Lastly, we would like to thank our sponsors, Soft Smart System International and Conquest Realty Investments. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We have a lot more coming. We will be posting a link if any of you would like to donate to the Special Children's Center. It's a really good cause um, and you can pull it up. You can see it on YouTube. They have short videos to tell you everything about the center. Um, it's a really great cause to donate uh, to that cause. Until next time, this is Etty Alkis and Karen Cohen, and we're Yentas in the City. Everyone stay safe. Thank you so much, Yaakov. Thank you, Yaakov. Thank you.